Hi, welcome to view this video on assessment. The video introduces you to a few central ideas about assessment and discusses some assumptions behind the choosing and using of assessment methods. The video makes use of the handbook for teachers by Hyppönen and Linde. It is a good place to start looking for practical tools and methods after this more theoretical start. Assessment serves many purposes, often simultaneously. It can be used to ensure that students have actually completed certain learning tasks. Sometimes it is used to rank people and use the rankings as the basis of selection, for example in the case of entrance exams. Assessment generally also motivates students to direct their actions in specific directions and may also help students to develop their performance according to the feedback received. All of these purposes are linked to the most important function of assessment, namely to guide students' learning processes. With appropriate assessment methods, the teacher can steer students' actions towards choices that support the achievement of the learning outcomes in the best possible way. Assessment has been noted to have a directing influence on student actions. For teacher, it is natural to start with the intended learning outcomes, then devise the appropriate learning activities and finally come up with the assessment plan. In student's view, it is equally natural to start by looking at the assessment and then adjust the studying activities to achieve the best possible assessment results. This results in learning outcomes that may or may not be the ones the teacher intended. This form of unintended consequence is called backwash. Backwash can have negative effects. If the teaching is not constructively aligned, the learning outcomes that the students achieve are often different compared to the intended learning outcomes. If, however, the teaching is well aligned, the assessment directs and supports the right kind of study. Assessment always contains assumptions about learning. In the quantitative tradition, the content is considered to consist of discrete units or chunks, and the aim of assessment is to measure how many of these have been attained. This kind of thinking applies quite well when we are aiming for the development of lower order cognitive skills, such as remembering facts, defining concepts or applying basic rules. If we are aiming for the development of higher-order cognitive skills, such as analysis, synthesis or creation, then the order or structure of the knowledge chunks becomes significant. The learning is then perceived as more qualitative than quantitative, and the assessment is needed in order to show whether we have achieved certain standards set for thinking. In other words, the focus is not on the chunks, but what has been made of them. Yet another thing to consider is who will do the assessment. The best choice depends on the perceived purpose of the assessment, as well as on some practicalities like group size. Self-assessment generally supports learning and develops students' study skills, but may not be reliable enough for selective purposes, for example. Peer assessment is a good way to provide students with feedback when the teacher does not have enough time for that. Sometimes external assessment is the best means for providing an objective evaluation of the achievement of standards. Because assessment usually serves many purposes simultaneously, it is often best to use a combination of assessment methods with different assessors. To ensure that the assessment is constructively aligned with the rest of the teaching, it is a good option to use, for example, the table introduced in the handbook for teachers. The table connects the learning outcomes, the teaching methods and the assessment methods and helps you to see if all the learning outcomes are covered by the assessment. The most common mistake is perhaps to leave out some important aspects of the assessment and thereby cause the students to disregard them due to backwash. Luckily enough, in the planning stage you still have the possibility to make changes. Just as with teaching methods, the world is full of different assessment methods you can use as they are or modify as necessary. The Handbook for Teachers provides you with a multitude of choices to start from. First, it introduces 10 different assessment tools suitable especially for continual assessment and then 16 different types of examinations. 
Like the book's presentation of teaching methods, the assessment methods are first described generally, and this is followed by a brief discussion of each method's strengths and challenges. That's all for now. Thanks for watching this video and have a nice dive deeper into the world of assessment procedures and tools.